Hearing okay. So um, I'm Tom Cleland. I'm presenting this work today in collaboration with Nabil Imam, who's, um, who's with Mike's group in the Neuromorphic Computing Labs here at Intel, my PhD student, Oyland Bortekur, and um, also some other students and postdocs from the lab who've, who I'll, I'll show you a little bit of what they've done in process. So I'm, um, I'm a computational and experimental neuroscientist. I've come to this sort of from the opposite direction and interestingly come to some of the same um, architectural themes as have, have come from, from the other sides of the neuromorphic um, computing community. Um, what I want to show you here is about some um, physiological data on the left and some of our models and syntheses on the right to point out a couple, or in this case, three particular architectural features of the olfactory system. So I work in the mammalian olfactory system. What we see here on the left are some beautiful images by Adam Pouchet of mitral cells. So down here we have what I'm going to call, is the, called the glomerulus. This is an apical dendrite up to the soma, the axons going out the top, and there's these lateral dendrites going out in a meshwork across the olfactory bulb that also support spike propagation. This is my um, uh, circuit diagram of sorts on the right, and what I want to show you here is this prime architecture of what these glomeruli are. So here in the periphery in the bottom row is, is the nose. There's a, here there's three, but in us there's a, about 400, in a mouse there's about 1,000 to 1,200 different receptor types. With, you know, these are chemoreceptors with particular sensitivities for particular aspects of um, airborne molecules. Those of the same type converge together axonally to form these glomerular tufts where they all sort of cram in there and then mitral cells like this one sample in that tuft. The main point I want to extract from this right now is that mitral cells glomerularly and the mitral cells that sample them are directly associated with one of these in mice thousand receptor types. So in other words, they are, um, their afferent pathway is exactly one receptor. And of course, if you have now a thousand of these receptors, you're dealing with a thousand dimensional chemosensory space, which I'll talk a lot more about. So this design feature is essentially what we call a, as bulb columns. So glomerularly mitosol columns. A second property of particular interest is when you stimulate, um, you know, give an animal an odor or stimulate artificially in various constructs, you evoke these field potential um, gamma oscillations, which I, I don't know how well you're seeing my light here, but the bottom row of this um, diagram here, you see these oscillations begin. These are gamma oscillations. They're classically about 40 to 80 hertz. And they arise, they're just, they're field effects from a substantial portion of the underlying cellular and synaptic networks doing the same thing at the same time. So coordinating with each other synaptically. And then they produce this field just because of that that we can measure and use. Um, you can see here, well actually let me get to the third thing. The, th and the third aspect of this is that among a interesting and important subpopulation of mitral cells during any given odor stimulation are phase constrained with respect to those gamma oscillations. So actually by the synaptic interactions, but we can observe this phase constraint with respect to gamma. And that's what we see here from data from Kashiwadani et al. 1999, the sort of first dynamical paper of, of its type in mammalian systems. And over here with our own um, slice recordings of the same thing, showing again this is a showing a phase constraint of these spikes with respect to this. These are, um, are examples from Goshi Li from my lab, some of our biophysical models that, that really go into how these gamma oscillations emerge, how they synchronize given all the physics of the biological system. Obviously that's not really what I'm gonna be focusing on here today, but it's a, it's a beautiful construct, a balance of synaptic and in, intrinsic subthreshold dynamics within these mitral cells which um, I recommend to you for late reading sometime. But again, the three points I want to make here are the columns, the existence of these gamma oscillations, which I'll talk a lot more about, and the phasing of spikes with respect to them, all being um, hardware features in the uh, biological system. So this is, a, I almost took this slide out because we started making this point regularly. Um, but we've long thought about when we, so I'm very interested in extracting the algorithms, um, both for artificial systems and for broader applications from the biological factory system. And we're always faced with the idea of which aspects are what we've called compensatory, which is sort of a joke word because it means 
things, aspects of the coding that compensate for the fact that your compute units are bags of saline. Um, things you have to do because you're working with cells and not, not um, sort of optimized materials. And the, and the other ones are things that might be part of interesting algorithms that we could use in artificial systems. And I'm going, so these are valuable. Um, I'm going to use these today to illustrate our approach to what I think of as the hard problem in olfaction. And also at the end, I'll talk about why it is, you know, even if you don't care a whit about olfaction per se or, or artificial chemical sensation, how the structure of our problems that we can solve and address with this system are extremely general. So we're not completely new to the neuromorphic transformations. Nabil and I and, and collaborators at, at IBM um, implemented or extracted algorithmic details from and implemented them in True North. Um, in 2012 for the, the, um, what we think of as the algorithms of this first layer, the glomerular layer. So again, sensation comes in the bottom in the nose, crosses the blood-brain barrier. This glomerular layer of the olfactory bulb has transformations that, that I and my collaborators elucidated, I guess, <laughs> a decade ago now, how time flies. Um, I'm not going to go into these now because the learning is more interesting, but the two main pieces of this are an inhibitory surround in high dimensions. In other words, it's like lateral inhibition, except it can't work via lateral inhibition because that's an intrinsically um, two-dimensional process in a cortical tissue. And of course, we have this high-dimensional thousand glomerular signal coming in. So the contrast enhancement is the function. Lateral inhibition is a mechanism for achieving that in two dimensions like the retina, but obviously not what we came up with here. Um, the second is a global feedback normalization. I guess it's kind of analogous to um, batch normalization. Um, but we did this with, uh, in 2007 in this network, and essentially using a small world network to accomplish what um, the effects of an all-to-all -all network without having anywhere near all-to-all -all connectivity. The limitation, of course, is that True North didn't learn. Um, and, uh, and so we are now, um, in addition to the Python examples I'll show you now, we're implementing these on Luihai as I speak. Um, and up in this sort of next layer. So we have these glomerular layer competitions. We're now talking about this EPL, external plexiform layer, which is this network of spike-supporting lateral dendrites from mitral cells and the granule cells that they interact with. It's essentially a crossbar, mimicable mesh network with um, mitral cells exciting um, granule cells and granule cells inhibiting mitral cells in return. But it's not, of course, a, a, um, a, a dense crossbar. It's quite sparse with respect to that. And it has a topology. Um, and the topology is sort of in this, this is a little bit idealized, but the topology is a lot like this cartoon here. The principle is that the mitral cells can um, activate granule cells, not everywhere, but anywhere in the system. And however, the granule cells can really only inhibit near neighbors simply for the physics that inhibition does not propagate in nervous systems. Um, for present purposes, what's exciting here is that this weight matrix is not associated with any physical chemical features. It's not stronger based upon what you might consider the similarity of two odors. It's not stronger based upon the physical proximity in the neural tissue of um, two of these columns. It, you know, it doesn't have any, any clear associations um, in our assumption and increasingly obvious assumption over several years has been that this is learned. This is where you begin to build internal representations of odor objects, um, which have all kinds of, of uses, which we'll talk about. And a second part, which is really more about the physics, but, in, but influences the way we've built these models, is that inhibition does not, as a rule, prevent spikes. This originates from just the physics. The spikes are generated here in the apical dendrite. They go rocketing past the soma up to the soma, up to the axon. And synapses that are lateral to that stream aren't in a good position to physically to sink a spike. They can, however, shape it. And we've done a lot of sort of physics work, you know, um, cable theory simulations of this. So this, in turn, again, points to spike timing regulation as the output of this learning network which again bears back on the phase constraints that we observe with respect to gamma oscillations, which we also know to be generated by this network. In the biological system, it's this beautiful emergent property, which we've studied in some, in some detail. In artificial systems, it's a clock that you, you know, 
um, that dominates everything coming in from the side. So, okay, let me sum up some of the key properties of the architecture. Um, this is now a familiar, this is a familiar list, I think, to everybody from their own context. Embarrassingly parallel, excitatory and inhibitory synapses. We do, of course, involve a lot of feedback loops, which I'll talk about. Um, that's important. I want to give a special shout out to inhibition. That's why I bold-faced it, because I've heard a lot of things about inhibition here, which is great. Historically, it's gotten insufficient respect, because I'll just tell you, from a neuroscience perspective, Everything interesting, representations, everything subtle, everything detailed in the nervous system is because of inhibition. Um, it, that's where the power is, so don't disrespect inhibition. Um, spike timing-based computations based on this gamma clock, which I'll talk about, and of course, with Luigi, we're now able to, in addition to on, in Python, add to hardware aspects of learning. So spike timing-based learning rules, we just heard a lot of this from Mike. Um, I will show you how the architecture of this, of the olfactory system, gives us extremely low interference, meaning it's, you know, in the whole theme of lifelong learning, new learning isn't going to break old learning. You can learn, stop, learn, stop, do things, other things, and, and keep coming back, and you can learn an indefinite amount of new stuff. Um, this, in part, relies on drawing us on some latent capacity, which the, um, in the biological system, the analog is adult neurogenesis, which in the olfactory bulb and the hippocampus are the two places where this is really prominent in the brain. So this has actually cued us to um, its computational power to sustain lifelong learning in this system. This is, again, another shout out to something we've all talked about. Um, we thought, we think about it as a sort of constraint through structure. We're not trying to do everything. And I'm going to steal Terry's phrase that the anatomy is part of the algorithm. Um, but to point out specifically that for the problem, you know, for addressing particular problems, building a particular structure embeds certain priors. So it's really good at that kind of problem. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. And this, among any, many other reasons, is particularly applicable for sort of resource-limited, low-power, um, and low-data problems. So what is the hard problem I've been talking about? So you'll see these pictures arise. Um, this on the left is sort of, this is the easy problem on the left. This is a fox who's um, caught and is devouring a rabbit. And the thing that's easy about it from a chemosensory point of view is that you have this nice, rewarding, delicious rabbit, and it's right in your face. Most of what you're smelling is delicious rabbit. Good opportunity to learn from a number of um, perspectives. The other issue, though, the hard problem, is what do you do when you're just out in the world looking for rabbit? And you can see that some of the, um, the compositions of rabbit are, are, are here floating around, but there's also a lot of other things. Um, nothing is particularly more high concentration than anything else. So how do you find, how do you identify the existence of rabbit? Now with this picture, you might think, well, okay, you just wait for, you sniff around until the rabbit odor hits you in the nose and you're good. But this is not remotely true. This is a punishingly hard problem. And I'll try and illustrate this sort of um, through these examples here. So here's some of our olfactory receptors here. Um, this is actually a general problem that will come back, so, so um, yeah, bear witness. Um, here's, say, for example, um, the several molecules of rabbit odor activate these three receptors to particular degrees, and that ratio is um, the, our sort of code of interest at a first approximation. These other bits of molecules also bind to those receptors with sort of um, characteristic, but to you, unknown levels. And you think, okay, so these are going to add up, but they're not. Um, not necessarily, at least. So we have these patches here are, are 100 glomerulus activation patterns. So just showing the activity vector of a given odor, where odorant A is delicious rabbit, odorant B is something else, and hot, hot colors are highly activated and, low, and black is, um, is not activated. So here and left by the little arrow, we have you know, a piece of odor A that's active, and then odor B just doesn't activate that. And so if you put them together, if you have some sort of mixture, meaning you've taken an inhalation on the breeze, both those odors come into your nose, bind to their receptors, you get you know, something that's fairly close to A, and that's all right. Up here you have what looks like the similar situation. This is um, one that's highly activated by delicious rabbit, and B is um, not but there's some, some is off. And this is because when we sort of go down into this, and these, this 
you know, these are all the competitive binding equations that are underlying this cartoon model here. Here, we have the odor concentrations right here. We have, um, not only are we fully activated, but it's an agonist. It's something that activates that receptor. B is even more sensitive. It binds even more strongly to B. That's the, the, um, the midpoint of that sigmoid being further to the left. But at full activation, it doesn't make the neuron activate. It's an antagonist, just like any sort of um, synaptic antagonist tool or, or channel antagonist tool we might use in neurophysiology. So in other words, combinations of odors might add, subtract, divide, just get in each other's way so that the sum of them is nothing like either. There's a whole complex history of mixture theory on this, which I'm happy to um, get into at another time. But for now, let me just say that odor sources can't be identified using just a forward, a forward calculation. They're too messed up by background. Um, our longstanding hypothesis has been that you can solve this through prior learning. You can solve this if you already know about odor A. And this is not just, oh, I can smell this now, and I have a label for it, which is rabbit. This is that you can't even do the source separation without knowing A in advance, without having a representation in your brain of A in advance from prior learning. So just a brief um, analytical image of this. So we think of these things, our activation patterns are n-dimensional activation patterns. So here's, like, you have three receptors. Each one can be, you know, so one is 75% active, two and three are about 50% active, so you get that particular point in three space is your pattern of these three receptors activation. Of course, in a mouse, is a thousand dimensional space. For illustrative purposes, we can map that homeomorphically onto a sphere. So, I mean, the three space would be onto a three hypersphere. So bear with me, it's a two sphere I'm showing you there. Um, and, you know, and this is sort of an unlearned, naive system. And catechal odor learning can be sort of um, presented by this goldenrod pollen in which you've sort of learned, each one of those peaks is a learned representation. And there's interesting ways this is actually useful to us, but for present purposes, I just want to use it to illustrate the point that the task has gone from being an impossible forward problem to a tractable Bayesian problem. Given the evidence, which of these solutions is most likely from a discrete number of solutions? And so you'll see that what we've, what we've done here is to, um, this essentially becomes sparse. Um, any sort of occluded noisy signals, even quite noisy signals, can be efficiently attracted towards, um, towards an, an odor engram, if you will. And of course, in high dimensional space, it's a lot, there's a lot less capacity for ambiguity than in this two sphere here, which is another way of saying the blessing of dimensionality protects against destructive interference. It's hard to get in the way of something that's you know, way, way over there. So the core principles, and then I'll actually show you some, some results. The pre-processing, which we've actually excluded from what I'm gonna talk about today, just to keep things simple, that alludes to the glomerular layer computations that I spoke of earlier. Um, what I'll talk about today is um, three key elements. One is the generation, so you have mitral cells that are activated. The key is the learned generation of these sort of higher order receptive fields in interneurons, um, which can provide sort of an arbitrary level of orthogonality. It's, it's, it's easy to make them fully orthogonal. That's not always what we want. That's a variable of interest. But um, what it means is that while the mitral cells are always going to end up being with highly overlapping representations, you can make it so the granule cell representations are as discrete and separable and, and non-overlapping as you need. The second part is, is mainly through inhibitory plasticity, although that's uh, concealing a lot of interesting stuff, is to just selectively deploy this inhibition onto the afferent stream, the mitral cells, so as to um, shape the representations from input to output, and then to generate attractors. This system is sort of intr in intrinsically prone to attractors towards these learned engrams, if you will, these representations of odorants, to identify which went in and via an interpretable method. So in implementation, again, this is actually the model, the, some details of the, of the simulations I'll show you. Um, I think we know, you know sensory inputs are feature vectors of a given length, and that length is actually determined by the nose itself. 
obviously. So in other words, the act of sensing itself is the projection of the signal into however many dimensions you have sensors. So you know, if I stick this MOS sensor, the schema sensor into it, it's gonna be a 12-dimensional signal. We ended up using 16-dimensional signals from real arrays of MOS sensors, 16, a, a battery of 16 MOS sensors. Um, their data set, this is by Zetanoff and Pereira Luna, Pereira Luna um, which provides you know, these real data from these chemo sensors by these, you know, compared to these three odorants. To make it a little more sporting, we've actually made some mixtures of these odorants and use those sometimes as our, as our test odorants, so they're less, less um, they're more alike each other than the source odorants. And of course, there's a lot of noise involved. So I'll be showing you 16-dimensional processing. Obviously, when we um, work with GPUs or Luigi, we can ex you know, extend this arbitrarily, which is, I think, really where the power lies, because a lot of the high dimensional effects don't kick in very powerfully at 16 dimensions. Um, and again, I'll mention that we also use these synthetic data sets that I won't really talk about today and some non olfactory sets. So, what we get out of the model, out of these simulations, is essentially a, um, a form of temporal code. You can also see that, so these are the five odors in the, in the ordinate here are 16, um, the 16 sensors. Odor A activates about half of them and not the other half, um, not above threshold at least. And the same is true for all the other odors, but the, but the complement of activated sensors is different. You also see that there's, there's um, reliable distributions in time. That's our spike timing representation. It's extremely simple, essentially, Greater, stronger activation leads to a phase lead with respect to the gamma clock. Actually, I should, I will remind you here that, that the bins you see here are essentially gamma clocks. There's an inhibitory phase when no mitral cells that are involved in the representation get to spike. That then inhibition releases, they get to spike. Those that are most strongly activated get to spike first because, you know, just for biophysical reasons or their implementations herein. And so the earliest spiking ones are the, are the most strongly activated. And we get this sort of stationary signal where every gamma cycle in this, in this model is a, it's a reset and you get this temporal pattern, which is, like I say, stationary. Different for different odors and I've just blown up odor here. Um, so if I talk about permissive phase, that's the gamma cycle that lets the mitral cells fire. In the inhibitory phase, the, the granule cells are firing um, in order to, to allocate inhibition for the next cycle, but that doesn't affect things until the next permissive phase. This is um, actually a, a useful hardware, um, hardware uh, capability in Luigi is these box synapses that implement these, um, these delays directly. So this is sort of the same thing. Instead of going cycle, 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 cycle from left to right, it's cycle, cycle, you know, the five cycles are from top to bottom here. So, you know, bear with me with this transformation. Signals are stationary, noisy signals are also stationary, because again, they're just noisy signals, they're just signals if you haven't done any pre-training. So the little circles are odor A, the spike timing pattern you get out of odor A from cycle to cycle. You see it's the same across all cycles. The blue dots are noisy odor A. So odor A plus just a lot of, of um, activation of random um, mitral cells, meaning other sensory activation, unknown background noise. And that is, of course, you know, that's a separate odor, but we show it in the same graph, and it's stationary too, because it's really just another odor. However, if we have previously trained the network, um, just using a few cycles on odor A, and have built that attractor, then odor A plus that much noise converges onto odor A, or is attracted to odor A. And so you'll see here, and you'll see it better in a, in a movie I'll show momentarily, that um, while it starts in the same place, the blue dots start migrating over and until they overlap with the, um, with the open circles. And then you see large blue dots, because open circle plus small blue dot. And the red dots there are odor B. The network's also been trained on odor B, but odor A plus noise is attracted to odor A and away from odor B, which we can see here. This is the similarity of that noisy stimulus compared to odor A, dick, 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 over five cycles, it goes up to be identical, and odor B it's becoming you know, somewhat less similar to. 
Um, this is on the right at the smaller graph is the same thing averaged over 10 odors, 1,000 trials, just to make sure you know, it's statistically reliable. Down here on the left is something I'm not showing you directly, but um, the data I just showed you are after about five or so training epochs, enough training to learn odor A basically asymptotically. As you do less, you know, fewer training epochs, the, um, the performance is less because you haven't fully, you know, you haven't fully learned that, that engram yet, the um, attractor is weaker and sometimes it doesn't get there. But again, five epochs, not thousands, not tens of thousands, um, to get you to this point of asymptotic learning. Um, so let me play you a movie. This is the same thing I just showed except with moving parts. You'll see there are these three different odors down here. Um, you know, we're using different odors at different times, but the point is that the open circles are the target, and within about five gamma cycles, the, um, the noisy stimulus, which has you know, odor plus different background odors, goes duck, 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 and attracts to the, um, so that the, attracts to the learned odors so that the black dots fit into the, the dotted circles. And again, this is, you know, it's an animation, but these are actual real-time stimulation results, not concealing 10,000 training trials under the hood. And you'll see there's one at the end that doesn't quite get there. Um, there's like there's one missing piece, and that's something we could presumably solve by one more training epoch. If my timing allows us to get there, let's see. Well, I think you get the idea. These are, some of these are, are becoming, you notice that this one's a strong um, positive odor. It's like lots and lots of extra spikes from all these different mitral cells. Everybody's activated, and some of them just get whoosh, um, depleted and, um, and pulled into the attractor. That's probably enough of that. Are you standing that it's about, about my time? Okay, I only have a, like, Oh, okay, so I'll whiz, I'll, I'll whiz, these are not important. This is just, just about the mechanism, and I'll really only explain this one and then skip through the rest, which are, are, are straight, more straightforward. Um, this is based on spike timing dependent plasticity rule. The important thing here is that SGDP left to its own devices will go to a winner take all um, solution, by which I mean that as you train a bunch of, of presynaptic spikes you know, with a postsynaptic spike so that those that precede the postsynaptic spike are incremented positively, this course makes the postsynaptic spike begin to phase lead and kicks some of the um, presynaptic neurons out of, the, out of that representation. So they start incrementing up and then, they're, um, then they become after the postsynaptic spike, so they go down. And this will proceed all the way to winner takes all, where one enormous synapses, synapse drives the postsynaptic spike unless you cap, do something like cap the, um, the Gmax of the synapse, and that means you get a K-based winner's take all solution, which is the source for these higher order receptive fields in granule cells. They become sensitive only to particular configurations of mitral cells. And if you let K be large, they become harder to stimulate at all, but much more specific. If you let K be small, they're more general and overlapping, and they need another tool to get you um, more specificity. Um, a key thing is that this learning permanently differentiates them, so they require replacement, which is adult neurogenesis in the, old, in the biological system or the addition of new, new neurons in um, artificial systems. Again, that's, um, that's not a problem with a learning network like a Weehi or a regular computer. Inhibitory plasticity boils down to moving, during learning, moving the granule cell spike time to a position where it's redundant with the... Um, with the afferent input, meaning it says you should, you're allowed to spike now at the same time as the clean signal would, um, would normally evoke a spike. And this works in both directions. So I'm showing you here that the spike, the granule cell spike time is delayed, and um, it would also work the other direction. The, um, and the outcome of this is just what I've shown you, is that when you say, okay, we're not learning now, we're out in the, we're out in the world, sniffing on the breeze, then the granule cell spikes are what end up shaping the, um, the mitral cell spikes towards, gradually towards that, um, that learned engram before, sort of pulling them towards the, uh, the learned attractor. 
this is a list of things we're going to, you know, all the interesting things that come next in terms of things like manifold learning and, and embedding contextual information, which is actually extremely early in the olfactory system. At the first synapse, you have things like spatial information and, co and context embedded in the representation itself, which, you know, maybe we can talk about at the end if anybody's interested in. But my last point to make before thanking people is that is about the generality of the system. So. We've been focusing on artificial olfaction because those are the data sets I was most familiar with, but for a while now we've been exploring their use in, again, other arbitrary data sets for classification that are rely on just arbitrary feature vectors. I put this up as you know, a convolutional network type problem as counterpoint. In olfaction, if you do the same sort of shift to the left, you just have a completely arbitrarily different representation. There is no two-dimensional substructure in an olfactory signal. It doesn't matter what this order is. And that's a truth that also applies to things like um, these breast cancer data sets, the you know, pan-can genomic analyses of various sorts. They're just long lists of features that this algorithm applies to um, having because it doesn't care about or require any internal substructure. I don't have anything to show you there yet, but I wanted to make the point that olfaction is an extremely general, um, is solving an extremely general fundamental problem in, in plastic and generalized classification. And with that, I'll thank the gang. Um, funding agencies, including the brilliant program Collaborative Research in Computational Neuroscience, and the folks in yellow have contributed something you've seen today from our um, analysis math guy, some of the electrophysiology, and Oyan and Goshi doing, doing modeling. Thank you, and I apologize for the extended time.